Welcome to the Whole Story Podcast. This podcast series is focused on inspiring sustainability in agriculture using the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs. Each week, our guests are invited to share their story, highlight a particular one of the 17 goals, and leave us with some practical tips for sustainability on farms. I'm Bex Smith, founder of The Whole Story, a B Corp certified social enterprise inspiring, facilitating, and articulating holistic sustainability in agriculture. And this podcast has been brought to life in partnership with the incredible team at FMG, who are passionate about partnering with organisations like The Whole Story, so together we can support rural New Zealand. So whatever you're doing while listening to this episode, thanks for choosing us. The best way you can support our mahi is to follow and share the show on whatever app you're listening on, and I hope this episode leaves you inspired and excited about the bigger picture of sustainability in agriculture. Today on the Whole Story podcast, I catch up with Emma Rowe, Sustainability Specialist for FMG Insurance. A bittersweet episode as it brings our first season of the Whole Story podcast to a close, but this conversation was a real highlight for me. This episode is based around the UN Sustainable Development Goal 17, Partnerships for the Goals, and that's why Emma is the perfect guest for this topic. Without the partnership that I have with Emma and the team at FMG Insurance, this podcast would not be a reality. Emma shares her agricultural background with us. She may be sitting in an office in Wellington, but her roots are in rural New Zealand. It's how Emma talks about partnerships, though, that blows me away. She discusses not only the partnerships that are collaborative and fun, like ours, but she offers insight into how to manage partnerships when you aren't necessarily on the same page, sharing a perspective or being constructive. So enjoy our last episode of Season 1 of the Whole Story Podcast. We've loved having you along for the ride, and we can't wait to have you back for Season 2. Welcome along today, everybody. We are at our final episode of Season 1 of the Whole Story Podcast, and I think we've saved the best till last. I would like to introduce to you all Sustainability Specialist for FMG, Emma Rowe. Welcome along, Emma. Wow, best to last. That is some high praise from you indeed. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't say that lightly. You are the reason that this podcast season exists and you and the team at FMG have been the most incredible partners and that's why we're here today to talk about goal number 17, Partnerships for the Goals. You're incredibly welcome. It is been a pleasure to work with you as well. And so I think kicking into it then, I'd love to hear the story of Emma Rowe. The story of Emma Rowe? Well, the story of Emma Rowe so far, let's say. I was born in the small, humble town of Fielding in uh, August of 1991. I am the youngest of three and the only girl in my family, so double spoiled. (laughs) So I actually grew up in a really tiny rural village called Halcom. My mum is like the epitome of a hardworking, empathetic, caring rural mum. She was always the mum figure that all my friends would gravitate to. You know, she was always looking after people and making dinner and making sure everyone was fed. (laughs) So I like to think I get my work ethic and ability to, I guess, have perspective and empathy for others through her. Definitely didn't inherit her cooking abilities. Yeah, she's widely known for her food. And I live by my air fryer, so mm, not sure what happened there. I get my love of music, pop culture, history and philosophy through my dad. He's a very quirky, genuine human. Two incredibly loving and caring parents who raise probably a very ambitious and stubborn daughter. And then I think my two brothers kept me tough and practical. <laughs> I left home at 18 to attend Vic Uni. So that was a a huge shift going from a very quiet rural town to bang smack in the middle of Wellington City. And I studied a triple major politics, philosophy and public policy. At the time, I really wanted to go into politics and I thought the way to do that was to start through that policy side of things. Yeah, I've always had a weird interest with politics and Actually, at 16, I worked for Simon Power during his election campaign, so I couldn't even vote, but I was eager. I guess when I 
graduate, I found it really hard to get a job in policy or any ministry back then. It was really, really competitive. I was working part-time in a cafe as a barista, as a waitress. And luckily this this cafe was regularly eaten by politicians, CEOs, lobbyists, presidents, you know, rife opportunities to network. And every morning I made a long black for the GM of corporate affairs for Contact Energy. And every morning I would ask him for a job. And honestly, one day he just said yes. And that's how I got my foot in the door in the private sector. That's incredible. I worked as a barista also through university, but I didn't have any opportunities to get employment out of it. That was a super ambitious and bold move. Well done. I mean, in Wellington, it's all about who you know, honestly. And I was about to graduate uni. I really didn't want to go full time at the cafe. And so that was probably the push that I needed. So from there, I became a graduate comms advisor. And like most comms roles, you work across all areas of the business. And that's when I discovered the social responsibility and sustainability side of doing business. I never lost my connection to agriculture, though. So when the opportunity arose to work for FMG, I took it with both hands. Yeah, so I've had the privilege to be working for FMG for, oh my gosh, just over seven years now. My role has changed a couple of times and I'm now the sustainability specialist at FMG, which means that I am accountable for our sustainability strategy. And that's not just our environmental impact, but also the social and the governance side of sustainability as well. That's awesome. And such a great story. I've really enjoyed hearing that background. So talking about sustainability then, it's a nice segue into my next question, which I always ask people, which is, you know, sustainability is a really big word. And I'd love to know, Emma, what it personally means to you. I love this question. A huge word, right? And what this podcast has done really well through the series is that most of your guests have talked about sustainability in its holistic sense. You know, it's not just an environmental issue. I love the four P's approach to sustainability, which if we translate that, basically when making a major decision, try and balance the impact across the four P's. People, planet, profit, and the fourth one, purpose. And that for me is such a pivotal part of sustainability because, yeah, I am a for-purpose business with the whole story. So purpose is really core to everything I do. So thank you for bringing that definition to the podcast. Another thing that resonates well with me is, and again, some of your guests talked about this, but sustainability is about thinking long-term trying to balance the needs of today without masking or avoiding the larger issues at hand. Otherwise, you just end up back in the same place in the future. I also like to think of sustainability as that old adage of quality over quantity. You know, it's quality of friends, not quantity of friends. Quality of food, not quantity of food. Quality clothes, quality furniture, appliances. It's that idea that is better to pay more or wait longer, or sacrifice a bit more in the short term, knowing that you'll get a better deal in the long term. Because we have so much choice, more choice than ever, on what we want to buy. And we can get it now, we can get it cheap. But little thought about where it's all actually come from, who's made it, what's it made from. And what really gripes me is that we often can't fix anything. You know, my toaster broke. and. I couldn't do anything but buy another one. And when it came to disposing it, there was not really much that I could do. So the system does feel a little bit rigged, you know, to just buy it again. And I guess that quantity of profits outstrips that quality part. Saying that, though, I think more consumers are really starting to change their view on that and starting to be a bit more enlightened about our spending habits, shall we say. That resonates so strongly with me because I literally have probably almost a room of our house that is taken up with things that are 
broken that need repaired or have pieces missing that I'm trying to chase companies to either be able to repair things or replace parts. And sometimes my husband, he goes, it must be really hard to be you because you put so much thought into all these different things. Just go and buy a new one. But it's such a core value to me that I actually have to hold on to these things, which does make me look like a bit of a hoarder, which is really unfortunate. I think so many people have that challenge. And even if it's not broken things, it's just useless things that they've brought on a whim very cheaply. I mean, I'm not perfect. Like there's been times where I've gone into Kmart and brought stuff that I didn't actually need, but it looked cool and it was cheap. So none of us are perfect. But even if there was just a better system of how to dispose of this in a better way. Yeah. And it's really cool to see repair cafes become more popular. They're popping up all around in the regions now, sort of little areas where people can go and get things repaired or learn to repair things themselves, which I think is so meaningful to actually be able to develop those tools to be able to repair your own things. So I think that's great. Good. Okay. Well, I will go and check that out and I will eat my words around there being no options then. (laughs) Sometimes they're like a little pop-up weekend and they'll actually get like specialists to come in, either an electrician or a builder. And so you can actually take along your electrical goods and have an electrician there so you're not just mucking around with wires and potentially doing something dangerous or hazardous. They'll have an electrician there to make sure that it's safe, that it's repaired properly, that you can get your electrical ticket on items. So I think it's such a good initiative and I'd like to see more of that normalized as part of how we actually deal with broken things in our home. Yeah, definitely. And they're hugely popular overseas. So it's awesome that we are bringing that into New Zealand as well. I think the manufacturing companies absolutely need to take more responsibility around that as well. Yeah, they do. It's not just all on us as consumers to actually find the solutions there. It needs to come full circle. Mm. So on to our next question then. You touched on there your rural upbringing and I do actually just want to go back to your mother. She sounds incredible. I can definitely see the empathetic side that you refer to of your mother come out in my dealings with you. So she's obviously had such an influence on your life. But talking about farming and agriculture, what was your earliest memories of that environment? So as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in a rural household and most of my days were spent on my grand's farm, the centre of our family hub, I guess. My gran, Mrs. Geeson, as she'll be known to the locals of Manawatu and Rangapsake, she's close to 90 now and she still lives and runs her 365 acre farm in Halcombe. Primarily sheep and beef and also grazing from time to time. My grandfather sadly died when Graham was only 32 and she had five children aged 11 to one. And back then people were like, right, you've lost your husband. You're going to have to sell up, move to the city. You can't run this farm anymore. My grand said, absolutely not. And so she ran the farm. My mum at 11 looked after the household. Because that's just what you did back then. Fast forward, my gran is a pretty well-known figure in Manawatu farming circles. Fun fact, she was the first person to breed bull calves in Manawatu. And she was an excellent dog trainer. Now she's a great-grandmother. My aunties and uncles and cousins all work on the farm too and keep it going as well as their own farms. And so the rest of my family are mainly all sheep and beef. And I've got one cousin who's a dairy farmer. What an amazing story and what an incredible woman. What leadership. I just think that's so strong at 32 to lose your husband and go, no, I'm going to take on this challenge with my five kids in tow and I'm really going to keep this ship running. I just think that's such a demonstration of tenacity. What an amazing woman. Yeah, it's like that clear epitome of, that strong rural woman that we all know and love. So 
oh, she's full of stories. I adore her. Every time you go back to the farm, she's just always got such an amazing yarn to tell and she's done so much. And yeah, really, really incredible. I'm so lucky. I got to grow up in a rural household. I might have decided to head off into the city for other areas, but I got that best of the both worlds. And I do appreciate that a lot. So we like to put you in the hot seat then. Can you tell us your funniest story relating to farming or agriculture? I was having such a good laugh when thinking about this. Full disclosure, listeners, I wasn't the most naturally talented or athletic child. I was also one of the younger cousins. Um, so I have so many stories of my brothers wrapping me in poly wire and being thrown into the dam or being made to walk back to the house because they drive off in the quad without me. <laughs> but I'll settle on a very good yarn. One day, my cousin Bex and I, And she's going to crack up when she listens to this. So we were playing on the bales. And yes, we shouldn't have been, but it's too much damn fun. Playing follow the leader. So she was running and jumping and then I would follow. I tripped and got my leg fully stuck down one of the gaps, like fully stuck. It wasn't just my gumboot that got stuck. And rather than help me, Bex just pissed herself laughing. But we couldn't actually get my leg out. And we were trying for an hour. And so we had to go and get my uncle at the risk of being in trouble because we actually had to pull one of the bales out in order for me to get my leg out. How did you manage to get yourself so stuck? I don't know. It must have just been that perfect angle. I mean, it would have gone right up to my thigh. So I was half dangling off one of the bales. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) that's such a good story so I wonder then if you could share with us your journey to FMG how you got there why FMG why FMG I mean I don't think many kids grow up dreaming about working for an insurance company (laughs) and everyone in insurance would agree with that so of course that was never in my sights to work for a company like that When the opportunity came to work in the ag sector again, but also more on the business and corporate side, for me, it was an opportunity to give back to the sector in a way that I could. You know, I mentioned that I wasn't the most kind of practical on farm savvy person, but I understood systems and strategy and how to help improve the industry and improve the livelihoods through the governance side, I guess. So with FMG, I think what I quickly realized is that they were really hot on that corporate responsibility, give back style of doing business. And it's not something you really think about or learn about when you're going to uni or high school around what businesses do. You probably learn, okay, there's a finance team, and there's a CEO and all this stuff. You don't often hear about the teams that their job is dedicated to bettering the business and bettering the clients and things like that. So that's FMG 101. You know, it's a 118-year-old mutual who's based on all profits go back into the business to either keep premiums fair and affordable But so much of that goes back into the communities. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But that community piece is so strong. And I guess I just love the fact that I could feel like I was doing good for the business I was working at, really. And who would have thought it would be insurance? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's really cool because it's a side of FMG that I probably didn't appreciate or understand until getting involved in this partnership. And it's been a real eye-opener to me to see how passionate FMG is about that level of giving back, to see that involvement in community and to see that real passion at the heart of the business to actually help rural New Zealand thrive and support not only your own clients, but actually 
the sector as a whole. So I can see how that would be a great opportunity in your career to actually get involved with a company like that that allows you to use your strengths and also give back to the sector. Definitely. And look, we're not perfect and we'll always keep trying, but we like to think that we are trying our best. (laughs) Yeah, and definitely that does shine through. So talking a little bit more then about the whole stories work and this podcast series, it's based around the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This episode in particular is focused on goal number 17, which is partnerships for the goals, which I mentioned before. But I'd love to dive into that goal a little deeper and discuss the work that FMG is doing and contributing to progress towards those targets underlying the goal. Definitely. Partnerships are a pivotal part of sustainability for multiple reasons. If we think about partnerships in the sense of people coming together to solve a challenge, when you remove that siloism and bring in a sense of unity, collective problem solving, trust and resources, the likelihood of success increases and the challenge seems less complex and overwhelming. It's like that old adage, a problem shared is a problem halved. And then you think of partnerships in the sense of community. So right now, it definitely feels like we are losing our rural communities and also some of our provincial towns as well. We're seeing businesses shut up their local branches. Obviously, forestry is having an impact as well. When you start to lose that community hub that has always been quite integral to rural New Zealand, it does make it a bit tougher. And for FMG, as I said, 118 years ago, it was built around these communities. And so recognizing the importance that they play in sustaining agriculture is why that notion of a strong, prosperous rural New Zealand is such an important part of a business success for us. And you can see it, you know, we haven't shut offices in provincial New Zealand. We've built more, in fact. And our style of boots on the ground, working with our clients. We do that because there's a real benefit to both sides. We sponsor and attend about 800 events every year. They range from the big ones like FMG, Young Farmer of the Year, your Melanoma New Zealand, classics like Golden Shears, Horse of the Year, Young Hort. Uh, goes right down to Ripper Rugby, uh, Lamb and Calf Day, and then, of course, Farm Strong. So FMG is the founding member of this incredible program. And it's actually mostly FMG employees who run that program day to day. I have the privilege of being part of that team. You've also got partnerships for building future leaders and solutions. And we've got a long-standing partnership with Kellogg's, Nuffield. We work closely with Lincoln, Massey and Canterbury University through our ag scholarships. AgriWomen's Development Trust, these partnerships all make sense because they just build this continuous sense of community and success. There's also strategic partnerships. And I guess for us, that's Federated Farmers, Farmlands, Rural Co, Irrigation New Zealand. And that comes from that notion of you can't be an expert at everything. And it makes much better sense to leverage your expertise. And as I said before, bring in that collective thinking. Even the insurance industry, despite being competitors, we actually try and build a bridge of partnership through the Insurance Council of New Zealand. And so we work together with the overall goal to just try and strengthen the insurance industry as a whole. Partnerships build stronger local economies as well. And I would love to give you a really good example of this. So arguably, the most common claim will be related to a vehicle. And I reckon rural Kiwis are probably most reliant on their vehicles. Because Bex, I'm pretty sure that if you lost your vehicle, you don't have a bus or an Uber that you can jump into like I can, right? So from a claims perspective, we need to get you back on the road as soon as possible. Historically, there was quite a weak relationship between your automotive repairers and insurance companies. There was a lot of paperwork and hoops to jump through just to agree on a price, to fix the vehicle, to get on with the job. 
And FMG's view was, well, you're the experts. We trust that you'll do a good job. How can we make this easier? And so we partnered with 76. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 76 now approved repairers across New Zealand. So if you're an FMG client, you can find your local shop and they can pretty much get on with the repair up to an agreed amount without waiting around for middleman and paperwork and get you back on the road. And the success is because we maintain a really close partnership with the repairers and they have to meet some pretty high standards. But these are family-run local businesses and having this partnership often means that those small businesses, they can thrive, they can take on apprentices, they can improve their waste management and facilities. And we've seen some being able to then actually give back to their local schools and sports teams. So it creates this strong, sustainable, circular economy. And with all these different versions of partnerships, you can see why partnership features so heavily in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, and in my head just then as you're explaining all those different partnerships, I couldn't help but keep seeing those different infographics pop up of all the different goals that that was helping progress towards. It was just so evident that those partnerships you build are really impacting progress among that whole myriad of goals. And I just think it's amazing to be able to see that just by developing a relationship with someone that your business or organization can have an impact on so many of the different goals. And you don't have to do all the heavy lifting alone, but that you're all in this working together towards the same goals. That was really well put. Yeah. Sometimes when you address a challenge or you just feel like you're on your own, you don't have to be. And it's actually not a very smart way to work. So Emma, looking at the sustainable development goals, which one of those do you align with most personally and why? Love this question. It's really hard to choose, but I'd say number eight, decent work and economic growth. And the reason why is twofold. Firstly, I fundamentally believe that you can use business to do good and that profit maximizing shouldn't be considered the arc of success in business. And profit maximizing is different to profit making. Secondly, the better you treat your people or employees, the better they treat your business, the more they feel valued the more value they'll give back. Decent work leads to decent livelihoods, which leads to decent health, decent wealth, and then that continues in a really positive, sustainable cycle. And large businesses can contribute and own most of this process. I just think that's so wonderful. It really aligns with me as a B Corp. So using business as a force for good. It's not about not making profit, but being able to use that profit to achieve a purpose for a higher good. So I think that answer really personally resonated with me. And also just that if you empower people, if you support people, then they will do good work. And I love that that's the one that aligns with you personally, because it shows through in the work that you do, where you actually take your skill set and you really maximize people, you elevate people and you empower them to be able to succeed. And that's certainly what I felt in working with you. So I thank you for that, Emma. Oh, good. I mean, that is what we do try and do. And it does feel like we achieved that pretty well. So many of the goals I really resonate with, but I think number eight, and to be fair, all of the goals connect to each other. But I just feel that when people are in a good mindset, that's when that innovation comes and that problem solving comes. And then you start to tackle the other areas like climate change and waste and inequalities and water quality. A good mindset is like the trigger that you need to then go off and do good. If we're not offered decent work opportunities, and if that is impacting on our mindset, then that's such a large proportion of our life, how are we actually going to go outside of our workspace and enjoy 
our time outside of work or give back to our communities or support our families and live life to the fullest and actually be able to extend that good mindset. Absolutely. And I appreciate that not everyone always has the choice of their favorite place to work in their dream job. I absolutely get that. But if you as an employer can just do everything you can to continuously improve the experience of your people, that benefit that I talked about before, you still see that, that still emerges and you still end up using your business to do good. Yeah, 100%. It's such a responsibility of anyone who's employing staff is to think about that wider impact of the employment on your people. And it's good for your business too, you know. Your business thrives at the same time. So looking then at the agricultural sector, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing this sector regarding sustainability? And how would you change the mindset on that, flip the script and turn it into an opportunity? Firstly, I think it's really important to acknowledge the immediate challenges right now. Increasing farm input costs, worker shortage, fast moving legislation, and just the increase in the intensity and frequency of major weather events. But to answer your question more specifically, in my opinion, the biggest challenge for the agriculture sector regarding sustainability is lack of certainty, which is leading into a lack of trust across the sector. So Hiwaki Ikenua, the primary industry partnership, is a great example of industry partners coming together to forge a fair and considered plan forward. It certainly took a few rounds to get there and there's still work to do. It feels like we're heading in a good direction. It's still relatively early in the pace, so there's still uncertainty and lack of information out there. And what makes it worse, and this is regardless of which side of the political horseshoe that you sit on, is sustainability particularly climate change, it's just been used as an election tool or for advocacy in lobby groups on either side of the coin to further their own agendas or gain popularity among their circles by blaming each other or spitting out contradicting science and information. And this constant bickering and bargaining, it's not a robust conversation. It's actually getting really hostile. And so then we're expecting farmers and growers and business owners to make long-term decisions with very little certainty and little information. You can't do that as a business. And no wonder confidence is at an all-time low. But the flip side of this is that there are a lot of dedicated and optimistic people who are working on finding solutions and forging a path forward. And I talk to them every day. I like how Mike Casey from episode eight talked about the people in the middle, the ones kind of ignoring the politics and the agendas, and they just want to find a solution that fits both sides. He said, these are the ones that are going to figure it all out. I have to agree. I could talk for hours about the innovation, precision farming, science, technology, mentoring, empathetic leadership that's going on in the sector. I mean, a lot of examples in this whole story series, and we've profiled countless FMG clients and their success stories. I was out at Dairy Trust Taranaki last week. Highly recommend looking at what they're doing, particularly if you're in the dairy sector incredible work and research and it's all designed to be shared across the industry and it's being designed by people who are really aware of all of the challenges that everyone's facing so they're not looking to design solutions that would only fit large-scale farmers or people with lots of resources they really know what they're doing and they live and breathe this stuff And this is another reason why partnerships are so key because not everyone has the resources to suddenly change things or trial a new tech or plant a new crop. It's a hard ask 
to risk your livelihood on trying something new. And so it's good to see large organizations partnering with their suppliers or providing incentives and opportunities to try new things. I just read this morning, see Nestle announced a partnership with Open Country Dairy. Fantastic example. Yeah, it's really cool to start to see those people in the middle, the people who are avoiding the political side, the agenda, the tokenism, sustainability, and just finding solutions and implementing them on farms. I've had the privilege, as you've mentioned there, to talk to so many people through this podcast that are shining examples of those people in the middle who are just forging ahead. And it's not easy to be in that space. It takes work and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy and enthusiasm because you have to remain optimistic. But yeah, there's just some incredible examples throughout our sector and how lucky are we both that we get to work with those people every day. We get to have those conversations and we get to see those opportunities. Absolutely. I thrive in that space of new ideas and new concepts and futuristic thinking. And I love the fact that I get to surround myself with such positive forward thinking people. Honestly, I know it's easy for me to say to sit here in Wellington, but I genuinely think that we're going to be fine, guys. We're going to crack this. (laughs) I love that sense of optimism. (laughs) And I truly like, I agree with you. I don't know. Maybe we're just two crazies off in a boat together, Emma, but I just have such faith in our people. I have such faith in the people of rural New Zealand to pull together, to innovate, to work hard, to support their communities and to find a way through this. All of it. You have to, right? You have to. What's next then on the cards for Emma Rowe? The next 12 months, what does it look like for you? Well, FMG has its own work to do in the sustainability space. We have our own set of climate legislation to work through. Yeah, and I guess the insurance industry, the reality is that the intensity and frequency of major weather events is probably our biggest challenge right now, and we need to really work through that. So my time for the next 12 months will be really understanding the best way FMG can support its clients in this space. There's a lot of things that we could be doing. I just really want to make sure that we are concentrating our time that will have the most value for our people. And at the same time, making sure that FMG's own operations are up to scratch, particularly on that environmental and social footprint side of things. 12 months isn't actually a long time in a corporate space. I know that sounds horrendous, but it goes very, very quickly when you're having to have a lot of meetings and make a lot of decisions. Yeah, I can definitely appreciate that. As you know, we love to leave our listeners back down at the grassroots level. So, Emma, I'm wondering if I could ask you to give our listeners one practical take-home action that farming businesses can take to contribute to sustainability. I thought about this for a long time, and look, I'm not an expert in those really tangible, practical pieces, so I wasn't going to talk about that. But my take-home advice would be don't underestimate the power of positive thinking. And look, it's not always that easy to do, but there are multiple benefits to your physical and mental health when it comes to positive thinking. It increases your resilience, your decision making, your motivation, your performance. It also helps build those closer partnerships and relationships. And as we've just talked about, the pathway forward, it will become clearer. You'll get the certainty. The technology, the science and the research will come and the knowledge and the how-to will be developed and perfected. But if we're still stuck in this really negative, pessimistic mindset all the time, it's all going to be in vain. It's not going to work because who's going to use it or who's going to trust it? And I think one of the most basic ways to improve your mindset in that positive thinking space is Empathy 101, literally just being kind and helpful and uplifting others 
I mean, scientifically, it releases dopamine in your brain and it makes you feel good. Working with Farmstrong a lot, we know that that verbal abuse and that hostility towards farmers is such a big issue. But we dish out the same hate sometimes just as much, you know, and there's some pretty shocking, filthy stuff that's being exchanged, particularly on social media. And what good is that doing, you know? Not only does it create a bad image, it snowballs into a really horrible, negative space to be in. And it's really hard to get out of that when you go really deep. So let's go back to backing each other and remembering at the end of the day, we're all people just trying to do what we think is best. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of farmers are criticizing others when they talk about their sustainability journey. And look, I know people are exhausted and scared and struggling, but abusive comments and rants on social media, it just doesn't help. Look, I'm not saying we should lose our passion and not stand up for our beliefs, but let's be adults about it. Try and understand where others are coming from. Try not to assume the worst. Form well-rounded arguments and be part of the solution going forward. And that's everyone regardless of what industry you're in. And trust me, I hear some ridiculous stuff coming out of very anti-farming groups in Wellington. But rather than get hostile towards them, I've actually sat down and had really good conversations and understood where they've come from and then shared the parts of farming where they've been misinformed or remind them that we're all people and that growing up on a farm you genuinely love your animals and your livelihood is connected to the quality of the environment of your farm and sometimes we just get a little bit too lost and we've got a lot of very strong influential people that are really trying to tear us away from that good middle so if there's one thing you can do be kind just be kind to someone else It makes you feel better. It makes them feel better. The power of positive thinking and empathy. I think that's just summed up so many of our answers from the podcast series because it's actually blown me away how common the conversation has turned to mindset and maintaining a positive mindset. So that practical take home, Emma, is really, really a reflection of all the conversations that I've had over the last 18 episodes. So thank you so much for sharing that and for reminding people to just be kind to others and have that empathy for another person's point of view or situation and to really lift yourself out of the doldrums and think positively because that has so many benefits for your own mental health and well-being, but also for the health and well-being of those around you and also for the success of our sector and your businesses. It does. And I really wanted to have some philosophical breakthrough and this amazing new piece of knowledge to share, but it really does just come back down to that whole treat others how you want to be treated. Optimism is contagious. It really is. You can sway minds and you can achieve a lot through the power of positivity. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's 100% what we're trying to do with this podcast. And I know there's so many people working so hard out there in our sector just to lift the conversation, keep that positivity going, because that is what we see is that if you can just have a positive conversation with someone else and you can spread a bit of optimism, then they will then go on with their energy and spread it to their neighbors and it amplifies. So you're 100% correct and it's such a wonderful place to leave our listeners today. So on that, Emma, I'd love to thank you so much for not only your time today and also your insight into the questions and your wisdom that you've developed throughout your career. But I'd like to thank you so much for this partnership and our relationship working together with you has been an absolute pleasure. And I really look forward to continuing that relationship. And yeah, you've brought me such 
positivity and optimism. And I know that that's come out through this episode. So thank you so much, Emma. No, the thanks goes to you, Bex, because we needed this style of podcast. We really did. And in these 17 episodes, and obviously this is the 18th episode, I've already seen such a change in conversation and sentiment towards this idea of sustainability. When we first launched, there was, I guess, concern about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and people didn't really understand it. And in the short time, I've seen conversations completely change. And even within FMG, we're looking at the UN SDGs, not as this weird kind of rhetoric that's come out of a huge political organization, but we can see how we all fit in our daily lives. And it's definitely strengthened that holistic style of sustainability, removed the idea that it's just about climate change and just about the environment, even though that's probably the key focus for us right now. But it's just given a lot of people a lot more understanding and optimism And they just don't seem as scared and worried to chat about the UN SDGs or sustainability in general. And that is a powerful, powerful thing to really help turn that sentiment and understanding into such a positive conversation. So thank you. (laughs) Oh, that just fills my heart with such joy, Emma. Honestly, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Whole Story Podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it and are feeling inspired and optimistic about putting sustainability into practice on farm. I have one last request for you before you go. Make sure whatever platform you're listening to us on that you hit follow and share the show or episodes with your friends so that together we can grow our community and inspire sustainability and agriculture in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And thanks again to FMG for partnering with The Whole Story so that we could bring this podcast to life for you all to enjoy. Catch you next time.